Good afternoon, everyone. Good conference so far? Yeah? Thank you all for coming out, especially pretty late in the afternoon on day two. Hopefully, you've enjoyed today's talks. And we've got one more for you here. This is IO 303, Best Practices for Migrating to Cloud SQL for MySQL. So it's going to be a, a MySQL-focused talk. My name is Brett Hesterberg. I'm a product manager here at Google working on Cloud SQL. And I'm Gabby. I'm a developer advocate, mostly working with databases and storage and Cloud SQL. And we're going to obviously be talking today about migration strategies going from a MySQL server that you manage yourself to Cloud SQL. And more than just talking about it, we're going to be doing it, or, or more directly, Gabby's going to be doing it live <laughs> with an application. Uh, before we jump into the, the subject matter, we'd love to learn a little bit more about you. By show of hands, how many of you are developers? Good chunk of the room here. OK. How about DevOps engineers? And DBAs, database administrators? Good handful there. How about reluctant database administrators? Oh, even more. <laughs> and do we have any managers in the audience? I think we've got some overlap. I was, I was certainly the fractions were adding past one there. <laughs> okay, thanks for that feedback. A couple more questions. Um, just by show of hands, how many of you attended Next last year? Okay, a good percentage. And how many of you, as of this moment, are managing a MySQL server? Good chunk of the room, great. All right. Well, I think we've got good content for you. The feedback certainly helps us shape this as we go along. Let me start with the big picture. What are we going to be not only talking about today, but also building today? What you see in this diagram is a MySQL server that can be just about anywhere in the world uh, with a replication pairing to a Cloud SQL replica. We've got an application at the bottom, which is reading and writing to our external MySQL server, while the Cloud SQL replica is keeping up with changes, with writes, updates, inserts being made to the external server. Um, what we're going to be doing as part of our application migra migration is essentially failing into Cloud SQL. And you see that depicted in this diagram, where now we've changed some things. The replication direction has changed. So we have Cloud SQL as our primary instance. And we have our external MySQL server as our replica. And we've repointed our application. Our application is now both reading and, more importantly, writing to Cloud SQL as the primary instance. From there, of course, we can configure things in Cloud SQL, ask Cloud SQL to do tasks like high availability for us, which is also depicted in the diagram. So that's our big picture today. Um, what we're doing this on is, is the back of a, a fairly new feature for us. We're very happy to formally announce external server support for Cloud SQL, for MySQL, here at Next. This just went GA last week. So you'll see this in our public documentation. And for those of you who currently use Cloud SQL, you'll see a brand new button in your UI in our Cloud Console, which is highlighted on this slide, and it's Migrate Data. We're going to be using the UI today to migrate our database. Uh, like everything in Cloud SQL, if it's in the UI, it's also in the CLI and the API. So depending on what you like to use to manage Cloud SQL instances, you'll be able to, to do exactly what we're doing today. Again, we'll just go ahead and use the UI. OK. Before we get too far in, I'm going to talk just a little bit about how Cloud SQL fits into Google's database portfolio overall. We'll get into a, just a bit about what Cloud SQL is and is not. And then we'll go to the heart of our subject matter, which is migration. And, and we'll do a live uh, database migration today. As you see on this slide, Google has a broad database portfolio. Right, right most on the slide are our third party or partner offerings uh, that are database specific on Google Cloud. Google Cloud generally has a large partner ecosystem. The list of third-party databases you see here is um, not comprehensive. There are many other offerings. This is a selection that gives you a feel for some of the databases available. As you look leftmost on the slide to our in-memory database category, our Cloud Memory Store team very recently launched uh, Redis support into beta. So if you do have caching needs and you're interested in a managed Redis, we have that now in Cloud Memory Store. Just right of center is our relational portfolio in the database uh, portfolio. And you see Cloud Spanner as well as Cloud SQL. Cloud Spanner, if you haven't had a chance to go to any talks about Spanner at this conference, I encourage you to do so. It's a great product to learn about. Cloud SQL's mission in the database portfolio is to be compatible. We are, we are offering as close to unmanaged MySQL and Postgres as we possibly can. 
so that if your application works today with MySQL or with Postgres, it will just work with Cloud SQL. In addition to the compatibility, Cloud SQL aims to manage the mundane aspects of administration associated with a MySQL server or a Postgres server. And we'll talk a little bit about those mundane aspects as we get into the presentation. Tim Kelton from Descartes Labs is a Cloud SQL user, and I think Tim sums up Cloud SQL fairly well. He's saying for his team, they choose to use Cloud SQL because it allows them to focus on other things. It allows them to focus on things that have more value for their business and their customers. Uh, Tim's worrying a bit less about database administration. When I tend to think of Cloud SQL, I tend to think of the technology stack that goes into running a database. Many of you raised your hands when I asked, are you managing MySQL today? So you know this stack, or at least some portion of the stack, pretty well. The leftmost column in this stack is the hardware column. This is racking and stacking servers, thinking about power and cooling for the servers and data center. As you move to the left, the next stack is the operating system itself, keeping that operating system up to date with patches. Move further right even than that, and now we finally get to the database. Beyond installing the database itself, we've got to patch the database, make sure it's secure, and do things like taking regular backups for data protection. Finally, right most in this, on the diagram is where things get interesting and we get into some advanced functionality using replication, for example, for high availability or read scale out. And thinking about things like, how do we determine if a primary instance is unhealthy? What should we do about failover? Should it be a manual task, an automatic task? All of this then gets wrapped into monitoring, where we want to make sure we know what's going on with our stack. What Cloud SQL aims to do is take this set of technology, the technology required to run a database, and turn it into a single API call so that as a DevOps engineer, a developer, a DBA, with a single API call, you can bring up a very simple development, da development database or a much more complex production database with high availability, automatic failover, read scale out. What is not shown in this diagram is what backs the Cloud SQL service. And Jason from Real Massive, another Cloud SQL user, points this out. Cloud SQL is backed by a 24 by 7 SRE team. These are the folks who write the automation and the monitoring to keep Cloud SQL's fleet of databases healthy. And when needed, they're the folks who get on the keyboard and bring an unhealthy database back to life. Jason's pointing out here that this is one less thing for his team to worry about so that they can focus their attention again on other things that they believe have more value. With that overview of Cloud SQL in mind, we'll get into migration options. If you are running a MySQL server today, and you wish to migrate that server, that MySQL database, to Cloud SQL, you have essentially a simple option and a more advanced option. Um, what I'll start by saying is, whenever possible, take the simple approach. It, it works, and it's straightforward to operationally uh, to implement. The simple approach is this. I have my running MySQL instance, my server that I'm running today and managing myself. I set it to read-only mode. My application now can no longer write to the database. The database data itself is frozen in time. I ask the database to export that data or dump in MySQL terminology, so I get all the data set, which is currently frozen. And when I have that, I take it and I upload it to Google Cloud Storage, for example, as a way to get it into Google Cloud. Then I ask Cloud SQL, import this data set. When Cloud SQL is done, I repoint my application at Cloud SQL and begin accepting writes. So a very simple approach. There's one obvious consequence of this approach, right? Which is downtime, and potentially a lots of it. Uh, there are ways to reduce downtime and where if you're thinking about a simple approach, an application that is reasonably tolerant of downtime, you can minimize the amount of time you're down by really focusing on how to optimize the import time. Importing data into a database can be very time consuming. So this is showing three general themes to optimize an import. Let's start first with optimizing your schema for import. Here it's all about handling keys. Um, as a starting point, import your data without secondary keys. You can recreate indexes after you've imported. Uh, second item here is import your data in primary key order. This has real consequences when we're writing data or importing into a database. 
The second theme you see here is optimize your Cloud SQL instance for import. Um, Cloud SQL can be scaled very small. It can also be scaled very large. And what I'm recommending here is think about allocating CPUs and RAM and storage performance to Cloud SQL so that it has the infrastructure, the resources, to run fast during an import. Also note that while I think scaling CPUs and RAM is very straightforward, more CPUs, more RAM equals generally more performance, in Google Cloud, we tie storage performance to storage capacity. So if you want more IOPS, more capacity is how you get those IOPS. If you know you have a 200 gigabyte database, allocate 200 gigs or more of storage to that instance so that you immediately get the IOPS. I say that because Cloud SQL has an option that allows you to tell Cloud SQL, grow the disk on my behalf, and you can start an import of a 200 gigabyte database with a 10 gigabyte disk. Cloud SQL will happily grow the disk incrementally for you as you do the import. What you won't get is the performance of the 200 gig disk until you reach that capacity level. And then lastly in this theme, turn off an advanced feature like binary logging for the import, which has a write consequence, has write overhead associated with it. Last theme here is know how to monitor the import process. Cloud SQL comes with a set of basic, uh, uh, basic performance metrics that we show in the, in the Cloud Console. Um, know how to look at those and watch out for reads. We're doing an import. We should be just mostly writing. If we're doing a lot of reads, that indicates the database is paging. We're exhausting our buffer. And we're, doing, we're making the database do a lot of extra work during import. So these three themes, these three ways to optimize your import can reduce the amount of downtime associated with our simple migration. One note here is that after import, we can undo some of these things. So I asked you to scale your instance large for the import. I'm not saying you have to keep it there indefinitely. That costs money every month. Cloud SQL allows you to very easily to remove CPUs and remove, remove RAM. So you don't have to keep a large instance in the long term. Scaling at large just for import can be a very cost-effective way to gain performance. Um, after import, you can turn on binary logging. Binary logging, Cloud SQL uses for some advanced features like high availability, point in time recovery, things that we think you should use. So go ahead and turn that on after import. And then, of course, re add, your in add your indexes back as needed. We talked about disabling some of that before the import. Bring those back now that you've got your data there. OK, those are general import performance optimization steps as a way to limit the downtime associated with our simple migration. Now, many of you saw right through the simple migration and said, that's great for some non-critical apps I have. What about my critical apps that aren't very tolerant of downtime? What do I do? And that's really the focus of our talk today. We'll go through it conceptually, and then we're going to do it all together live with an application that, that Gabby has written. This diagram shows how we're going to minimize downtime today with our live app migration. You have an application pointing at your existing MySQL server. It's doing reads and writes. It's a live application. We're going to tell that existing MySQL server do an export of your data, do a dump of your data as it exists right now. The database starts doing that export. We don't stop the database from accepting new writes. New writes are coming in, updates and inserts are coming in. We get the export out, which is now a little bit stale. We send it off to Google Cloud Storage, and we import it into Cloud SQL. This process may take minutes if you're really lucky, hours, which is common, maybe even days if you have a lot of data. So you now have a Cloud SQL instance that has a data set that's stale. It doesn't have any of the updates, inserts that have been going on while we're doing this process. The upside is our app has been up the whole time. Our users are still happy. What we do here to catch up the Cloud SQL instance is set up a replication relationship between your existing MySQL server and Cloud SQL. Uh, we've called this external server replication, where your external server is still the primary instance. It's still accepting new reads and new writes, and that's the important bit here is the new writes. Cloud SQL, once it begins to replicate from your external server, is starting to catch up now. It's, it says, OK, I'm four hours behind. I've got some work to do. And it begins to catch up all the while your external MySQL server continues to serve traffic. So we've, we've had no downtime thus far. Once we know our Cloud SQL replica is in sync with our external MySQL server, the two have the same data set. The last transaction I wrote here to my external server is now in Cloud SQL. Now we can make our failover. Now we can make our move. We set our external server to read only. We say, freeze the data set as it is. We make sure that our Cloud SQL replica has that data. 
and then we break the replication connection. Now we repoint our application to Cloud SQL and we tell Cloud SQL, become the primary instance. Start accepting writes. You are now the primary instance. Our application begins happily writing again and we've migrated into Cloud SQL or failed over, if you will, to the cloud with minimal downtime. The key here is that this process minimizes downtime for a database of essentially any size. What you saw here is we were keeping our external MySQL server, our old primary, up as long as we needed to to make sure we could get the data to Cloud SQL and that Cloud SQL could catch up via replication. This works on large data sets as well as small data sets to limit downtime. So it's one thing to talk about this, but let's start to see this in action. Gabby has an application based on a LAMP stack. So a very common uh, stack that we see folks using. This is a single VM that includes the MySQL database, Apache web server, PHP, and we happen to be running what is becoming a very popular WordPress site. So Gabby's WordPress site started small. She's now gotten a lot of additional traffic, and you'll see why when you see this site. Uh, she has decided to scale. She needs to take MySQL and that, that workload off of this server and send it to Cloud SQL. So we've got our current state here. We are on a single GCE VM. One thing to note here is that this could be physical hardware. This could be a server somewhere in the world. This could be a VM in some other cloud. Um, but the point here is that Gabby has full control over the database in this VM. She desires to move to a world where she's offloaded all the MySQL load to Cloud SQL, where her VM now is simply a web server with a connection to Cloud SQL for its database needs. And we're going to get into exactly how to do this. In fact, we're going to do it live on this, this URL. Sorry about that for the errant click. If you wish to follow along, if you want to see for yourself what does downtime look like, what does this app look like as we're doing this, fire up your mobile device, browse to this URL. What you'll find is Gabby has created a WordPress site that has the listings of every Google Cloud Next 2018 session. So obviously it's a hot site and it's now struggling under its own load. You can watch us do this live. We'd love to get your traffic as we go along. So make sure you see when the site is down, exactly for how long it's down, and when it comes back up. Gabby? Just a moment. Thank you, Brett. Let me, let me give the URL up on the screen here. Oops, can you switch it back um, just for a moment? Okay, you can see? Okay. So this is a WordPress that I imported the data from all of the Google Cloud Next sessions. Uh, for now, um, you can just browse through it. Uh, it's working. It's on a single VM on Compute Engine. And today we're going to migrate that MySQL server from the VM to the Cloud SQL. For purpose of clarity, I'm going to be calling primary the server on the VM and replica the one that we're going to be setting up now. So Brad showed you the new menu on the SQL dashboard, or dashboard on the console. So once you access as, uh, the SQL menu, you can see migrate data here. And as we said, we're going to be using the UI to be doing this, but you can also use the API or the CLI. Uh, once you start with begin migration, you need a couple data, and you need to have prepared your server for this. Uh, one of the things that we require is for you to have binary logging on, on your, mass, on your primary, and also have GTID enabled so we know which uh, last transaction was executed on the server once you generate the dump for import. So I'm going to create here. I'm going to zoom in. So name of the data set, I'm going to put um, next 2018 migration DB. So the IP address that I have for that website is the same VM from that, uh, that address is this one. Yes, I'm copying. 
Oh, you also need to have a replication user set up on your primary server to have the permissions necessary to copy all the data. Uh, in this case, I created a replication user called replication. And I'm going to click here so you don't see my password. Once you set up that, uh, you need to make sure that the database version that you're using, you, uh, we are supporting MySQL 5.6 and 5.7 for migration. Uh, so my, in my case, it's MySQL 5.7 on the VM. So I'm going to just keep it as it is. And if you use certifi certificates for SSL and TLS, you can set up in here and add your certificate. In my case, I'm not using it. Also, click on Next. It's going to ask you for the name of the replica you'll be creating. Uh, I'm going to keep the name that proposed to me. It's the same name as the primary that's uh, with Cloud SQL added to it. Another important thing is um, if you know where your server is, it's ideal for you to get a database server that's closer to it, the same region or even the same zone if possible. In my case, if I look on the Compute Engine instance, I am on US Central, and my zone is F. So, so the latency doesn't get too high. I'm going to keep it on the same zone. As Brett mentioned, too, you can scale up for this import. And I'm going to choose a two CPU with 7 and a half gigabytes of RAM. Uh, the idea is ideal proportion is if you have a five gigabyte set, get at least uh, 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 instance with at least 10 gigabytes, so you can load out in memory and don't have any problems with that. As I said before, you need to have GTID and binary logging enabled. Uh, you need to generate a, a file, a MySQL dump, using the MySQL dump command. And once you generated that file, you want to upload it to Google Cloud Storage on a bucket. It's the bucket's private, so you don't need to worry about security. And you just choose which file it is that's going to be imported. As I said before, this does have the information as DTID and binary logging that's going to be used for replication. If you're going to be connecting to this database without the Cloud SQL proxy, which it is our uh, binary application to be transparent for connection. It makes your application think that the server is local. You can also whitelist an IP address. In this case, I'm going to whitelist the IP address of the VM that we are using. So you need to give a name. In this case, it's application. And I'm going to use the same IP address as the database because they are on the same server. So one point here is that Cloud SQL comes with a built-in firewall. And what Gatsby's yes. doing right now is telling Cloud SQL's firewall, allow a connection from this particular address, which is her application server. If we don't do this, Cloud SQL is going to block the network connection. Yeah, you could, in theory, whitelist all IP addresses on the internet. We don't recommend you to do that. <laughs> that is an official non-recommendation. <laughs> we don't recommend you to do that. but. Uh, for this example here, uh, we're just going to whitelist the IP of the application. Once you hit Create, what's going to happen is we're going to start to provision an IP address for this instance that's being created. This IP address that's going to be created here, it's not the IP address you're going to use to connect to the instance. It's the IP address you're going to use to whitelist on your primary server to your firewall to allow the connection to the database. So you don't need to put all your server through the whole internet to see. So once that's created, um, provision, you'll be able in here to use this IP address to whitelist on your server. Clicking on Next gives you more information about promotion. We'll skip that for now and just created it. Because this may take a while, depending on your load, on how big it is, your data set, I already baked a replica. On, on, on the side. So we're going to be connecting here to first to the local server. And I want to show you how many posts we have in here and compare to the replica. So in here, I, ha I have 456 posts. And if a replication is working, it should have the same amount. So let me connect here. 
And the IP address is so 456. But you're like, is the replication really working? You don't know. We should find out. We should find out soon. A way to find out is let's create a new post. I will create a new post here. Welcome to IO303 on next. Welcome. It was successfully created, so if you go to the page, you'll see that scene there. Uh, and let's see the count again. So here on the local host, we have 457. So it did add a new post. And on the replication, also 457. So replication is working. You could also see, uh, use the MySQL on commands to see where on the binary log you are, where, which was the last GTID. This is just a simple approach because it shows a lot of variables on the screen and it's hard to read. So next, next, uh, next step is to freeze the writes on our primary server because at some point either you stop the instance and I have actually a downtime, and since this is an application that's mostly read only, you can just lock the writes and be able to go through the migration to the new replica and promote it to primary. Um, what I'm gonna do for us to have uh, an idea of traffic here. I'm gonna simulate a bit of traffic and to, to about 100 requests per second. Uh, and then I'll do the, the migration here. And as a quick aside, how many of you are familiar with Google Cloud Shell? Okay. That's, that's good. We, we joke that it is Google Cloud's best kept secret. It's a, it's a VM that's provisioned for you automatically. You can use it to explore your project or even do some development work. And Gabby, you're using it, it looked like, to run a load generator. Is that right? Yes, uh, because if I, I, I had an experience where I was doing the load out of my own machine, and Google's blocked me because they thought I was spamming. <laughs> so <laughs> not, let's avoid that. So between your load generator and I'm sure many of you are browsing the session site that Gabby has built to find out where you're going next tomorrow, we've got some load on our site. Yeah. Right now, I just locked the, for the primary database, and it should be still reading, but it's not going to do any writes. If I try to edit the post, it's not going to work. Uh, the next step for that uh, is to edit your connection string on your application. If you're using Kubernetes, you can redeploy, or if you're using um, any continu continuous deployment tool, you just change environment variables and do that. I'm gonna go to a simpler approach here. I'm gonna edit the file because um, it's just um, a WordPress installation. And I do need to put, again, I'm gonna replace the local host, which it is, again, the database that it is on the same VM with the one that we are setting up here. It's not gonna show anything, but now it should be pointing to the replica. Uh, we still have one step to do, which it is to promote the replica to uh, primary so we can have writes again on your database. So once, once you go back to the SQL um, menu and access your primary, uh, your, I call primary here, but like when you access your instance, you'll see here this button, promote replica. And once you click on there, it's gonna, uh, Disable the read-only flag on your database to just to be to accept the writes that it wasn't before. And before, and just after you click here. So right now, what's going on with the application? Is anyone hitting it with their mobile device? Is it up? Yeah. Up what? and running. I, I was asking what's going on with the application right now. It's yeah, it's working, and I'm sending while now it's doing the promotion. I'm sending more traffic to it to see if you get any errors or it, if it catches any downtime. So let's see if. At some point here, it's going to finish. <laughs> yeah, so while Gabby's doing the promotion again, I think a couple key steps here. One is we validated that data on our former primary server, our LAMP stack, 
exactly matched that on our Cloud SQL replica. We made sure that the two were in sync. Gabby did this by showing number of posts with WordPress. Mm -hmm. There are a, a good many ways to do this. If you have a very active application, you'll need to set your external MySQL server in some read-only mode so that the writes stop. Then you can begin the cutover. Gabby used a, a, a sed command to substitute essentially the IP address of the Cloud SQL instance in her WordPress config file rather than localhost so that the application now begins to shift and point to Cloud SQL. And then the key step here was what Cloud SQL calls a promotion, which is you as an administrator telling Cloud SQL, I want to take this read replica, which is read only, and promote it to become a primary instance, meaning accepting reads and writes. What Cloud SQL knows from that point forward is this instance is no longer a follower of something else. This will accept writes and blaze its own trail, so to speak. Yes, correct. And right now, uh, it's promoting. <laughs> and you can see the applications with downtime right now. So if you try to access the application right now, it's having uh, problems accessing because it's not finding the connection with the database. And this is the cutover point, and I think you're seeing it in the audience. Right now, the application is down. So this is when you would schedule the on the order of one to three minutes of downtime for the migration. Gabby had shown you that for the bulk of the process, getting the data to Cloud SQL and setting up replication, your app is live. You can do these things during business hours. When you're ready to cut over, meaning when your application is most tolerant of downtime, then we want to wrap up with these steps. Yes. And just waiting now. <laughs> and the key to any demo is that it ends up working here. Yeah, that's the problem with demos. <laughs> Generally, a promotion in Cloud SQL takes about one to two minutes. As Gabby mentioned, we're doing some configuration work in MySQL itself, um, which takes a bit of time. And then we're doing some configuration work in Cloud SQL to essentially move this replica to a full-blown primary instance. One thing to note here while we're watching the promotion is that the external server technology we've released allows for the reverse replication to happen as well, meaning we can, as a Cloud SQL primary server, replicate to your external server as well. So effectively, you're able to fail into Cloud SQL and fail back out. Uh, in case of a problem with this migration path, for example, you may wish to re-promote your existing server back to primary. And this gives you essentially an out uh, when, when you're going through this process. We think it's important to note this because we want to make sure that migration to Cloud SQL is as easy in as it is out. Cloud SQL is compatible and open, and we want to make sure that you have as many um, on-ramps as you do off-ramps, so to speak. Yeah. Um. Do we roll back? <laughs> <laughs> we, we have some unhappy app users right now who are desperate to know about sessions yeah. tomorrow. Yeah. Let's me try with the other promotion here, with the one that I just created here with you all. This is the IP address. I think what happened. I don't know what happened. I don't know. Let's see. I'm going to do the same side command, and I'm going to change the promotion here for the other IP address. Okay. And let's promote to the one that we just created. See if it goes. So we'll see if we get our promotion complete here. And if we don't, obviously, we've got a bit more work to do. Yeah. You got it to 100? That's good. For the questions, and we're happy to take a few questions at this point of the demo, if you can come up to the mic that's in the middle of the room, just so everybody in the room can hear and so that we can make sure Yay, we it well. worked. <laughs> <laughs> I, the well, other one didn't, but this one worked. <laughs> <laughs> so now let's see if with, uh, I'm sorry for interrupting you, so sorry. Uh, let's just do a final test here. Let's create another, edit the post. I had a typo here on next. Let's update it. 
And let's see if on the front, yes, it, the E is down again. Yes. Finally. <laughs> Thank you. I configure. I had pre-configured an instance before, so uh, because I did not know how long it would take to get ready and not make everybody wait, and then I used the one that I already had created before to do the promotion, which it didn't work. So the one that I created live here was the one that actually worked in the end. Okay. okay so with that, Gabby, then what we saw is the final step. A critical step is when the application's down, it's controllable generally in time regardless of database size. And in this case, we hung on tight and it worked. Our application is back up and running. So thanks for the patience there. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay, so to quickly wrap up then, and we appreciate the questions along the way, we've ended up in a realized state for our application where we've moved MySQL off of our single VM. We've taken the M out of our LAMP stack We've moved this load now to Cloud SQL, our site's operational again, and that's really the motivation for this new functionality in Cloud SQL. It's very much this kind of migration path, where as I mentioned, you can do this in each direction. You can migrate off of Cloud SQL in this way as well. A few next steps for you all. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, use a simple approach for migration whenever possible. Um, that will be for non-critical applications that are reasonably tolerant of downtime. Think about reducing that downtime by optimizing your import. Generally optimizing your import, whether you're using the simple downtime migration scheme or the more advanced low downtime migration that we just demonstrated, optimizing that import um, will be wise in either case. To get started with Cloud SQL, if you're not already using Google Cloud, I recommend uh, starting with a free trial. You get 300 free trial dollars, which can be used on any product in GCP, including Cloud SQL. It's a great way to start to learn GCP and Cloud SQL as well. A couple presentation picks for you. We're on day two at the conference. We've got some, I think, great sessions tomorrow as well. These are ones that caught uh, the, my eye as well as Gabby's eye. Um, we have one about reinventing databases for your journey to the cloud. I think those of you who are interested in Spanner and more generally our database portfolio at Google would enjoy this session. Um, for one about kind of how to think like an SRE, how to use Google SRE for availability, reliability, scalability in hybrid environments, this one's really appropriate, especially where many of you are contemplating migrations to Google Cloud. Google helped invent SRE, and I think that session will have a lot to share around how we think about these things in cloud. Last one on the list, a tongue twister, computing with power not previously possible with BigQuery and Compute Engine. This one uh, it really describes what you can do at big scale in Google Cloud, lots of CPUs, and with uh, an application like BigQuery. With that, on behalf of Gabby, I want to thank you all for spending a chunk of your afternoon with us, and we'd love to open up to questions. Thank you.